Today, we're going to talk about the hydrosphere and the water cycle. Maybe you've imagined that rain falls from the sky and could do so forever. And if it kept raining and raining and raining, it could cover the entire planet in water, like in the book of Genesis in the Bible. Well, if you think that way, sadly, you're mistaken. The waters on our planet moved in a closed cycle that is fundamental to understanding events such as rain, floods, or even the sea level rise. So if you want to know if a total flood is possible and where this water would come from, you'll have to watch the whole video. Today, you're going to dip your toes into the massive pool of Earth's water. So put on your swimsuit and turn on your neurons because we're starting an amazing journey to understand the water cycle and the hydrosphere. First, we'll start with the water cycle, which explains how water circulates on Earth. It's a really simple and easy to understand cycle, but it's also really important to fully understand how the ecosystems of our planet work. The first thing we need to know is that Earth is a closed system, which means that it doesn't receive water from external sources such as outer space, but it also doesn't lose water to outer space either. So on Earth, we always have the same amount of water but as the term cycle implies, this water is constantly in motion. Let's say we have a body of water like a lake. The energy from the sun causes water to evaporate where it goes into the atmosphere. Evaporation is the change of state of water from liquid to gas. Water can evaporate from anywhere, from seas, rivers, or even land. But since almost all of the planet is covered by oceans, that's where most of the water evaporates from. This water vapor rises in the atmosphere and forms clouds that, when cooled enough, cause the water to condense. This process is called condensation, which is the change of state of water from gas to liquid. The water droplets precipitate and can fall on the sea or, more interestingly, on land. Precipitation is when this condensed water falls from the sky. If the water falls in a liquid state, we often call it rain, but if it falls in a solid state, we can call it snow or hail. If the drops of water freeze when they fall, they turn into ice. Freezing is the change of state of water from liquid to solid. Finally, snow and ice eventually melt after they hit the ground. Melting is the change of state of water from solid to liquid. After it melts, the force of gravity causes the now liquid water to always move downward. Some of the water flows on the surface and rivers, while other parts seep through the soil and move underground through aquifers until eventually it reaches the sea, where it will once again evaporate. Of course, the heat from the sun can evaporate water before it returns to the ocean. Evaporation also occurs in lakes and in rivers. Even the living organisms such as plants or animals add water to the atmosphere through breathing or sweating, a process we call transpiration. And that's it, that's the water cycle. This cycle repeats itself over and over and over again, and it has been the same for billions and billions of years. It's truly a never-ending cycle. So then lies the question, can a flood like the one in the book of Genesis actually happen? Well, since we have a finite quantity of water on Earth, it can only rain a certain amount of it. For all the rain, there is an equal amount of evaporation, so the sea level is relatively stable. The only way to cause a significant sea level rise is to melt some of the ice that covers parts of the planet. National Geographic made some calculations if all of the ice caps of the world melted, and this is how some of the continents would look. As you can see, vast regions of today's coasts would be under the water, but there's truly not enough water on Earth to cover all of the land. So it seems this biblical flood would not actually be possible. However, I'm sure another kind of flood is possible. A flood of likes. A 
Okay, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I'm really not proud of that one. But seriously, if you are enjoying this video, please don't forget to click like and subscribe along with the notification bell so you can be notified when we upload a new video. Something as simple as this is super important for the channel and really helps it grow. So thank you so much if you do that. So anyway, now that we know the water cycle, we know that when we go to the bathroom and flush the toilet, our urine goes to the rivers and then into the sea. That water evaporates, then it rains on us again, and we drink it again because, as I mentioned before, the Earth is a closed system. So we always have the same amount of water, and that water is in continuous movement. So yes, it's very possible that the next time you drink a glass of water, what you're actually drinking is dinosaur pee. Slimy, it's satisfying. Although, you should know that only the water itself evaporates. The other particles that are in the water, such as the salts from the urine, dirt, viruses, and so on, can't actually evaporate. So the water that evaporates and rains down on us is, thank God, clean water. Uh, usually. So now that we understand the water cycle, let's learn about what we call the hydrosphere. The hydrosphere is the layer of water that surrounds the entire Earth. Water can be found in these three states as we described above. Solid, such as the ice that covers the poles. Liquid, such as seas, rivers, and oceans. And gaseous, such as the clouds in the sky. You already know that there are large rivers on our planet, like the Amazon and the Nile River. Maybe you think that most of the water in our world is actually in the rivers since we usually have plenty of water to drink. If you think this, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. Let me show you why. If we observe the Earth, we'll see that 70% of its surface is covered by water, while land only occupies the remaining 30%. 97.5% of all the water on Earth is salt water. That means only about 2.5% is fresh water, which is the water that we can actually drink. But not all of the fresh water is accessible to us, as fresh water is distributed amongst polar ice caps, rivers, lakes, and also the atmosphere. So of this 2.5%, 68.7% is actually in a solid state, found in the polar ice caps or glaciers. What that means is that most of humanity doesn't really have access to it. I mean, if you live in a country like Spain, or Nigeria, or even Australia, or one of the hundreds of other countries with no access to the ice caps or glaciers of any kind, you won't be able to drink that water. Actually, no one can, except for maybe the penguins. Bruh. Next, 30.1% is groundwater, which is the fresh water that flows beneath the surface. The way to obtain this water is by drilling wells into the ground so that it can be used for drinking or irrigation. Some desert areas have crops not because of the rainwater, but because they extract this water from underground. In some cases, the underground water regenerates every few years when there's enough rain, but in most desert regions, the water is from thousands of years ago. That is called fossil water, and when it's gone, we'll run out of it forever. Other sources of fresh water take up 0.9%, which leaves only 0.3% of fresh water on the surface. And of this 0.3%, 87% is in lakes, such as the Great Lakes of North America or Lake Victoria in Africa. 11% is in wetlands, also known as swamps. Swamps are not abundant around the globe, but they are areas of amazingly high biodiversity, meaning a lot of different species exist within them. And finally, only 2% of the surface freshwater flows through rivers. It is a minuscule amount. Remember that this 2% is 2% of 0.3% of the surface freshwater on Earth. So speaking in terms of all of the global water, only about 0.0001% of all of our planet's water is flowing through rivers. If you've made it this far, please click like and subscribe. You might be interested in watching one of the next videos that talk about more interesting topics. 
So if you love geography and geology and history topics, check out more of our videos and share them with anyone you think might be interested. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next time.